Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Education Transformation 2020 presentation, Integrity in STEM Online Testing. My name is Alex Seville, and I'm on the training and support team at Hawks Learning. And our speaker today is Dr. Joy Beverly of University of Miami. Dr. Joy, Be Joy Beverly is a mathematics instructor at the University of Miami. She teaches several undergraduate mathematics courses, including finite mathematics, pre-calculus, and calculus. Her research interests include innovative classroom approaches, student persistence, and integrated curriculum. Dr. Beverly studied mathematics and education, earning her BS degree from the University of North Alabama and her master's degree from Troy University. She earned her Ed.D. in higher education uh, with a concentration in educational research and statistics from Florida International University. She has been teaching university mathematics for more than 30 years, beginning with positions at Troy University and the University of Alabama Birmingham. She then moved to Miami to teach at Florida International University before moving to the University of Miami in 2001. Dr. Beverly is a UM Excellence in Teaching Award recipient, the faculty advisor for UPUP, and a member of Iron Arrow. We are so excited that Dr. Beverly is here today to share her insight and experience with us. We do have a fairly large audience and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, Kayla Elkin on the marketing team here at Hawks is also joining us in the background of today's webinar. She is here to help answer your questions throughout the webinar. So please enter those into the Q&A as we go along and she will write back to you. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Beverly, we will save those for the end of the presentation. On that note, I will hand it over to our presenter. The floor is yours, Dr. Beverly. Thank you. Um, my name is Joy Beverly, and of course I teach um, mathematics, and so uh, maybe a lot of my examples will be from mathematics, but I've also um, been collaborating with uh, some of my colleagues in chemistry and physics and find that we have similar problems with integrity in online testing, especially because we were uh, forced to pivot so quickly from um, being in person to being um, um, completely online and then also having some things happen in the summer where I was able to to try to not only create good tests uh, but also to work on testing procedures. So just to talk about the importance of students actually just doing their own work, doing their own authentic work. Um, what I try to tell my students is this, I don't like to talk about so so much about how to cheat, how people cheat, um, talk a lot about cheating, instead talk a lot about honesty. Just, I had one student recently that kept saying, but how, what would cheating look like? And, and it was almost as if he was trying to get a playbook, I don't know, for how he could move forward and not get caught or maybe how he could avoid it. But I said, just submit your own authentic work. As long as you're creating it with your approved resources, you should be fine. And you shouldn't have anything to worry about or make you nervous, especially if you're being videotaped and maybe proctored through video and that's um, maybe a novel uh, approach for students that as long as they're just doing their own work, then they should be fine. All right, so let's look at these kind of two areas on how we can promote academic integrity when we're in an online testing environment. Um, the first one is the way that we construct and deliver the exams to the students. That's the first thing we have to think about and think about how we're creating those and delivering those. But the second one I think is very important is proctoring whether it's live online in the classroom or something that is delayed with a video, whether you are gonna watch the video later or a service will watch the video later. And I've actually done both. So we'll talk about both of those approaches. But when we're talking about the type of exam that would promote integrity and students doing authentic work on their own, um, we may have to write a lot of original questions, which of course takes a lot of time also multiple forms as we would in the classroom. One problem with this is as we're disseminating these forms online, um, it's different than if we might have um, a controlled paper copy in the classroom, which students wouldn't maybe ever have, um, have in their possession. Now, every time we broadcast one, it's, it's out there. And so having to come up with new and original questions is very, very time consuming. From the students though, perhaps we could require written responses, supportive work, even though many of you are aware in math and physics and chemistry, uh, maybe in biology, but definitely in math, I know that some of the apps that will help students to 
to not be honest and not do their own work, but will do the work for them, will not only provide the answer, but also will provide the supportive work. Um, require some application with the calculation and not just the calculation or the answer. Um, I've actually gone to providing formulas or open notes in some cases, because if I don't, I feel like even the good students would say in a room like this, be able to somewhere have a formula instead of memorizing and I wouldn't really know. So I think it's better just to go ahead and take away those formulas and things, the, the tendency to want to write those somewhere they shouldn't have them and just say, I'm just gonna give it to you or let you have it on a sheet. Um, if you're trying to prevent students from illegally collaborating, then present one problem at a time, make the order shuffled, uh, prohibit backtracking if that's allowed on your software. And also um, maybe and this kind of goes with the supportive work, but require not just an answer, but a reflective or an explanatory sentence. When students do that, it may become evident which ones have uh, either just not had full understanding or with their answer and maybe they got it themselves or not even gotten the answer themselves at all. And those things are a little bit harder to find or glean from online sources. And if it's, if it's available to use a pooling feature, then instead of having just 10 questions, maybe 10 pools with questions. So maybe 15 in each pool or 10 in each pool. Again, I understand that that is time consuming. Um, but I would recommend not making just a giant pool. If you have calculus, 500 calculus questions and you're going to tell the computer to choose 20, not very effective, might not get the types that you were looking for. So my objectives are very narrow. When I write a calculus pool, it wouldn't just be derivatives. It would be derivatives using chain and product rule and um, a very narrow objective so that I could pull from those and make sure students got the types of questions that I wanted them to have. Uh, if you're going to deliver um, an online test, it's really best to have a practice exam. It should be very low stakes just to familiarize students with the exam process. However, it's going to go down in your online classroom. Um, you want them to see a type of question. It might just be if you have multiple choice, you might say, did you read the syllabus? Yes, no, part of it maybe. And just so that they can familiar familiarize themselves with how it's gonna go down when they start to you know, answer these online um, exams. You want them to perfect their setup. And I'm gonna talk a lot about the setup of the view with proctoring and how the, their setup in their um, testing environment should be. Kind of on the backside, you also, if you do a pretest, which is very low stakes, usually students would not cheat on a pretest. And so you'll get a sample of their handwriting if you ask them to do a few problems or some easy problems or write a few sentences about themselves just to have a sample of their handwriting. Now, just having said that, I find that as the years have gone by, I don't see students having other students write their work as much because of the apps and the online sources students are simply sending their math problems to the source and getting the answer back again with steps they don't even have to type it in it's through a photo it's in seconds that they can get these answers back it's just very tempting for students to do that rather than to do their own work so the handwriting sample is good and we do have a few students that have gotten kind of caught up in that where someone else was writing for them but most of the time um, i think they're just sending to these apps um, make sure on the practice test that you allow um, multiple attempts so that they can get it right on this low stakes test. Um, maybe, maybe no stakes. It may be just that they have to do it to take the first test. And when you do, give them very detailed feedback. And I would give feedback or I will give feedback on this practice test for my students to every single student. And the reason for that is this is a five minute test. I have an hour long test coming up. I have 250 students and we're going to talk about how I am really not going to be able to look at every hour of every student's test on video when it happens. But what I can do is look at this five minute test. And when I look at this test and I make a comment on the placement of their uh, hands or the or something in their environment it lets them know that I'm looking and they will project that and believe that I'm always looking. That's been my experience. So I will correct something or make a comment on something. There are very few students who get 
everything right on the pretest. So I will have a chance to correct some of that. I think that the most important thing, and I've talked with chemistry about this as well, is not the way you're seeing me with my head and shoulders here, which is what some, um, some disciplines would want, but the hands in the workspace must be showing. Because by and large, this is the way that students cheat by taking um, some, sort of, um, some sort of a phone or some sort of another laptop and using some, more to, some other technology in that way. So it would be with their hands and looking at their workspace. So I think that is the most important thing. If you're gonna watch them and proctor them live as you're proctoring in an online classroom, I've done this before and I have a gallery view but my classes are large, so one gallery view is not enough. So I'm either switching between gallery views or I have two laptops and a desktop set up so that I can watch them all at the same time. I've tried different modes with presenting the exam. Obviously, if I just share my screen, they all have the same exam and they are very good at sharing with each other, even in real time. Um, I have to make sure their hands really stay off the keyboards, either mostly or maybe almost never touching the keyboards, maybe only minimally, because uh, one of my students was cheating and she kept going to the keyboard and she said, I'm just trying to make it bigger, but the work that she turned in turned out not to be her own. Um, record if you can, and it doesn't always record the students as they think, but they hear it's being recorded and they're not sure what's being recorded. And verbally, you could correct someone or something. So if I say, um, Erica, I can't see your hands, and everyone seems to, you know, show the hands uh, if their hands are off screen. And if necessary, then we would, and we have a statement I'll share with you that we use here in the University of Miami at our mathematics department that the department has written to be able to call students back in for a live oral exam if necessary. So we have a kind of a blanket statement. Here is a classroom. This one is on Zoom. And in this classroom, these are not real students. These are, uh, these are actors and volunteers. And so out of these five, four of these students, I have instructed to actively cheat in some way on this. So you see the top corner with the student who is um, using her Apple Watch or she has a smart watch on and she's looking at it. I would say all watches need to come off. Another student who has just gone dark, you can't see what's going on. Another student that's using an unapproved calculator. And surprisingly on the bottom, the student whose face you see, she is using a second laptop and a phone and an illegal calculator, but you can't see it. So the look that we really want is from the last student where it says Jerry Beverly here. Um, and that is not Jerry Beverly, but that is my son-in-law who is modeling here to show us the best way that we are supposed to set up for math um, testing and for chemistry testing so that the student has the hands uh, fully visible and is doing the work on their own. All right, what if you're gonna go with a monitor, monitor or video service? Uh, we use um, Respondus Lockdown Monitor or Browser with Monitor, so that produces videos for later on. I know some universities are using services and the services will look, but it's very different for STEM and the settings are vital and what if you have a service, what the service knows is vital because they will continually tell students to let you let them see the face either electronically or in person um, but it's not seeing the face i think that is so important it is seeing the workspace so these things when we look at the settings are important um, also to contribute no backtracking i think is important you have to lock students into the browser i thought that a lockdown browser would automatically lock in but it didn't in some cases um, either no calculator or maybe an online calculator. I mean, I have here just a case, but I had a student with a phone behind a case. And so it wasn't a real, even a, an approved calculator. It was something to hide something else. And it's difficult in the uh, remote setting. Um, the thing that I do on Respondus is to deselect notifying the students during the exam because otherwise, as they look down to do work, it will continually interrupt them to tell them it can't see their face. And then they end up trying to do a problem like looking down like this, which is not really appropriate. So it's a little bit different positioning. Now, uh, these are some of the settings I use on Respondus Lockdown Browser. I do force completion. Um, 
don't touch the password. The password is generated because it's on monitor. So don't change or give out the password. It's an automatic thing. Uh, I make sure that I don't use my own password, but I just have it display at the correct time. I also um, will uh, present the questions one at a time and prohibit backtracking. Maybe your software allows you to do that. So these are some of the settings I use on the test itself. When I go into monitor, what I didn't understand at first when I started using it was that if I re require the lockdown browser and the monitor, I have to open up the advanced settings. I did not have initially lock students into the browser checked and I couldn't figure out how students were exiting. So what they were doing is looking at the test, they couldn't access other sites. But they would exit, go look at an answer, come back, out and in, and that really defeated the purpose for me. Also, if you'd like, you can enable a calculator if you expand the advanced settings so that you could use an online calculator. Just has everybody at the same level of calculator if you're gonna allow that. I do um, customize these settings where I edit the text here for what I want my students to see. Uh, one of my daughters is in nursing and nursing school actually has them take out their phone while they're in the beginning phase, take a picture of their computer because students have been known to stick sticky notes and different things on the computer or have other windows open. And so ask them to show that, to make sure that their even their computer screen is clear. And this is probably the most important thing, is the facial detection. I have to deselect the notifying the students because otherwise they are constantly pinged when they look down to do, to do work. So I'd like to show you, um, this is my daughter who has modeled cheating for me. So I had her take this um, short test and she's modeling cheating. She has earbuds in where she could be listening to something or someone else. Uh, and yet, Respond has flagged her as very low concern. Why? Because it can see her face. It can't see her hands. And her hands were on a phone and an illegal calculator and all kinds of things to help her on this test. So I had her do it again, where she pushes her hair back so I can see her ears. She checks in with her face, but then she moves it to show her workspace for the rest of the time. And that's what I'm really looking for from my students. However, Respondus tells me there's a high likelihood she's cheating. So it's completely reversed, I think, for what I want students to do because I want them to show not their face, but their workspace. I have a student here who is using a straight on a setup, but sometimes students will say they can't get this setup because their desks are too small. So sometimes students go to the side and it's very helpful to go to the side. So here is throughout the thumbnails that I see I don't have to watch the whole video. I just look at the thumbnails, see if I see anything suspicious, and I move on because I can't look at everyone's video. It's impossible. And I can't look at everyone's work in detail. All I can do is review what I can review with the time that I have and not, not stay up all night with my 250 students. So what I do is I do designate students who I already suspect of maybe cheating on homework because I see something suspicious there, I'll just kind of look more carefully at them. I'm looking for other red flags. I'm looking for their hands leaving the frame. I'm looking for their hands on the keyboard for more than just advancing the screen. Uh, I'm looking for two hands on the keyboard. I'm mostly using my professional opinion to see a mismatch between the classroom performance and the online testing. So if a student can't answer any questions in class and is perfect on their test, I, I would just be looking into that. I would also be looking into that if, if a student's perfect in class and not doing well on tests and see what's going on with the mismatch. Students often work too fast. They use advanced methods or, or strange methods that we have never done before. And I found that before that's provided to them by an online solver or a machine. Sometimes they're supposed to submit written work through a PDF and there's a big gap between when they say they're submitting it and it really is submitted. So maybe things are being changed. If we do believe that there is a lack of integrity, um, I think we have to act swiftly and decisively. We have to report them because if we don't have a report, they could be cheating in four or five different classes, but it just seems like a one-time thing. So not necessarily to have a student expelled or suspended, 
but just to put on record that we have a concern about academic dishonesty. This is the statement that our department has written, and we say that we have the right at any time on any assignment to have students come and verify their work. Uh, an example was I had a student who finished an assignment in 12 minutes and it took everybody else you know, an hour and I myself could not do it in 12 minutes. And yet in class, she couldn't answer the first question. So I called her in and I just said, well, there were 12 questions. I need you to do one. I'll give you two minutes. It was one minute per question. I'll give you two. And, and she couldn't even begin when she was live. So she admitted to using a solver and try to use some as an educational moment on a low stakes um, homework so that we could bring her back into the class and so she could finish. We do have an honor council and maybe you do too. And if you have an honor council, work with them on the process. So it kind of comes down to this. In STEM teaching with chemistry, with math, I believe that the right hand setup is the preferable setup for watching students and proctoring them as they take tests. Even though services will look for the face and the left-hand setup, in these two instances, the student on the right is not doing any type of cheating and the student on the left is doing multiple types of cheating. And I think integrity is really important. At my level, where I'm teaching here at the university, we have students that are pre-med, pre-engineering, and there are serious consequences if students lack integrity or they lack skills or they are relying on a machine or a phone or Googling something to get the answer and they really don't have the skills themselves um, to move forward. So um, that's one of the reasons why you really want to do that and also to protect the student. If the student here on the right is not doing anything wrong, he might not do as well as the student on the left who is actually doing um, a few things wrong. So. Um, that's it for me today, and I think now um, Kayla is going to come back and share some questions. Yes, absolutely. So thank you all for your questions. We've had quite a few come in, so hopefully um, we'll be able to get to most of those. Um, but Dr. Be Dr. Beverly, um, a number of them are in regards to um, kind of equipment-wise, what you're, what you're recommending for your students. So predominantly, are students using phones for the video? or webcam or a computer camera? And are they potentially buying a separate one? Or kind of how do you address that with your students? So since we went um, remote, one of the requirements for taking the class is that they have a working um, webcam and that they also have audio and that they have um, a, a setup and it's a description of, of a desktop that they would use. So I was much more lenient when we were forced into this in the spring and I just kind of let students join however they felt comfortable, cameras on, cameras off. This has completely changed this time because it was not successful. So now I say students need to find a desk or a table where they can work and that they need to have their camera on at all times. This is in class. So it kind of gets them ready for that. And then when they set up, yes, they have to have some kind of laptop most likely. Um, we do have some students who can't make things work and we try to work on it before the first exam. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was kind of a, a related question of if they are using a laptop camera um, and that's preventing their ability to kind of get their hands and still see the screen, um, if you are, you know, encouraging up front to have a separate webcam or kind of how you, but dealing with them one-on-one -on -one is good. Um, we also had a question about the layout. Um, if a student is not showing his or her hands, um, do you give the student a zero for the test or are you just working on them one-on-one? -on -one? Well, if it's live and I can talk to them, I do know that it is interrupting the rest of the students. But I will say, um, Erica, I can't see your hands. You need to move. But, but before the test starts, if it's live, I have them all set up. I don't start the test until everyone is set up. And then if they stray from that, I'll say something to correct. So I set them up to start with. We also practice a good bit in class. But if it's on video, um, again, they have practiced with a practice test on video. And I have given feedback until they've gotten it right. But if I'm videoing it, watching it later, um, what I can do is if it's a first time offense and then I can bring them in and it's more work for me, I understand, but I'll bring them in for a retest live. So I might give them a portion of the test or the full test or retest live. I've also had students who did nothing wrong and their video just failed due to bad internet or I don't know what. 
Um, and I would call them back in, ask a few questions. If I felt like it was legitimate, I just go with it and let, let, the, let, the, um, let the score stand. Yeah, thank you for touching on that. One of our other questions was in regards to students who may not have sufficient bandwidth to run video and the site, they might be able to get to the exam site, but not be able to handle both. Um, would you handle those in a similar way? Yeah, I would. And one thing that I also do when we're using the remote video, we do, we do give these during class time. So if you have an 8 a.m. class, they should go to Blackboard and start the exam at 8 a.m. So everyone's taking it at the same time. Of course, that allows for, not, for somebody not to take screenshots, send it to somebody else, even if there is a pooling thing going on. And so they're all taking it at the same time. They tend not to help each other as much. But when they go to Blackboard, I go back to my classroom, whether it's Zoom or Collaborate or Teams or whatever else you're using, and they go to that classroom every day, but they don't go on test days. But I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and inevitably someone will come in and panic. My internet doesn't work or something went wrong here or there. And I always have a backup paper test and I say, okay, have a seat, set up your, everybody's over there videoing, I'm gonna give it to you live. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like proctoring, it's like I'm in a blank room, the video is proctoring, but I'm waiting for problems there so that I can kind of shore those, those students up. Okay, awesome. Um, we also had a question about um, students who may have privacy concerns, uh, particularly if they have to show an ID, have you faced that and how have you addressed it? Yeah, um, yeah I think we've, <laughs> we've thought about privacy as but we didn't think of everything and I think everybody can relate to this you know you think about your educational and you think oh this will work and then something happens so um, our provost has come out with very strong statements to say that the camera should be on and they should be live and watching you I had a student in the spring who started snoring and he was in bed so we're not going there anymore. We're saying sit at a desk and show your screen always. Is it a privacy concern? Well, if they were coming to class, I would see them. Now, I know that some students, uh, I think we're dealing with students that are partially here on campus and maybe are more affluent. And so they don't face certain situations that maybe others would face in a different school setting. So that can be an issue. I've had people say, why don't they use a background to, you know, to cover their background? some machines can't handle it and so you can't so that can be an issue but the thing that we've gone through this time is a lot of roommates don't realize they are in view and we've had them changing clothes and doing all kind of things in the back while class is going on so it's a lot to think about um, but for a test which is different from class we we ask them to find a good place and we have provided a lot of places but internet is it, it's an issue having reliable internet, it is. Sure. And hopefully being aimed at the desk as you're recommending to their hands does limit how much background is right. being shown, hopefully, in many cases. Um, one question about one of the recommendations you made um, as another tool to help address this uh, in regards to backtracking. Could you expand on the reasoning behind that benefit one more time? Right. So I had a student who explained to me how she cheated. And how she cheated was to go through all the questions send them to the solver, pretend to work, the solver would send them back to her, and then she could back up and fill them in. And she said, it's so frustrating when they don't allow backtracking because it's harder for me to do that. She said, I have to send them one at a time, and it's very frustrating. And uh, she wasn't in my class, she was talking about another class. And I do have colleagues who say, well, let me say this, we give a no backtracking on, uh, say, multiple choice, and then we have maybe five or six problems that are open-ended that they have to write. So what I tell students is this, my colleagues will say, what if they have a revelation about number one? And they're like, oh, I shouldn't have written that. I always tell them, you, the last thing you do is the paper. So hand write me on number one, I did not answer correctly and I wanna change my answer. Now, theoretically in math, they're writing work down on their scrap paper the whole time anyway. So if they want to change something, I tell them they can, you know, they can uh, write it as a, as a side note to me. I don't have many that do that though. Sure. Um, and when they, can I say this, when they can backtrack, they take too much time because they go back and forth, back and forth. So. Yeah. Um, one other question, what technology are you personally using to get the gallery view of exams? 
Um, when we, we use Zoom, um, we, we can use Collaborate. Zoom went down the other day, so we had to go to Collaborate. Um, but we use Zoom and a gallery view. And like I said, I'll open two laptops and a desktop and try to space it out where I can see different, you know, um, I don't know if it's 25 or on the screen, I can't remember, but however many on the screen so I can see them at one time. So I'm using Zoom with gallery. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a question coming through chat. Uh, proctoring seems necessary if we're to certify performance, yet high stakes testing um, can be extremely unpopular among students, administrators, politicians, um, and many others. But any ideas on how to kind of soften that image of proctored assignments or how your provost um, may have attempted to do, that, do so? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on where you are, because with younger students, I think you do especially want to soften it and lead them into it. Um, but the message is, you know, as long as this is your own authentic work, why wouldn't you want to show yourself, you know, presenting your own authentic work? Um, and, um, you know, we have a real problem, I think, in this country with numeracy and not really valuing it and requiring students. Like, I. I, I'll tell this real quick story. You know, what if four graduate students went into a restaurant and the restaurant had a little box in the middle and said, put all your phones in the middle so that you don't touch your phones and you have a nice conversation. So they said, ha, and they do that. And then they eat the meal and the bill comes out. And when the bill comes out, they look at it and they're like, oh my God, I know we're supposed to split this, but I really can't divide by four without using machine. I can't add the tip without ha ha, this is funny, we're not good at math, and it's hilarious, and they get their phones back out, and they have to use their phones to figure the tip and to split the bill because they just can't do it. But if you reverse that and say the same situation happens, they put their phones in the middle, and the waiter comes out, hands them the, the menu, and they look and say, ha ha, this is embarrassing, but I can't read. I need my phone to read it for me. It has an app. Here, it'll read it out loud. We think that's absurd. But we think the first one is kind of funny and we relate or some people in our in our society relate but in numeracy and illiteracy we, we don't stand for illiteracy but we're willing to stand for innumeracy and we need to push for literacy and numeracy without at least the basics without having help from an outside source i think in both cases so part of that you can call it high stakes testing but I'm saying there should be a multitude of ways you do work, but at some point you have to say, this is my original work. This is my authentic work. Sure. Um, thank you. We have a couple of logistical questions. I'll try to kind of pair those together. Um, for a written test, how are your students submitting that work to you if they are not face-to-face? -face? Right. So we, they usually go through multiple choice. And then for the written portion, which is the bigger portion, we watch them create it. And their phones have been put out of their reach, so they have to stand up. They announce to the screen, I'm going to go get my phone. So they walk over, they get the phone, they come back, and they have apps that make PDFs. And it makes multiple page PDFs. So they take the PDF, and then they announce to the screen, I'm now going to send it. There is a way, it's difficult, but to send it while in lockdown, but it's difficult for some students to do. So we have a Dropbox and Blackboard. And they have five to, we say five minutes, but we'll take it within 10 minutes to send that in. We have to make sure that it is a copy. We have had other students sending a link, which they change later on. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, and it's still a little dicey, but we're looking for them to send that work. Yeah, doing the best that we can. Um, a related question, for a traditional one hour test um, that you might give in person, how much additional time are you allowing to give that test online? Uh, probably about 15 minutes for the upload and the, you know, kind of bringing everything together in the end, yeah. Okay. All right. Let me see what else we may have. Um, this one has a couple of answers from fellow um, colleagues in our meeting, so thank you for that. Um, and then I'm going to read um, the overall question. Uh, this instructor teaches economics, but similar to math, they solve a lot of problems and draw graphs. When students are taking exams in class, they use paper to write on and they ask them to write not only the final answer, but also the solution and explanation of how they obtain that answer. Now with online exams, do you have any idea um, of how we might be able to achieve that similar outcome? 
uh, in Blackboard, they can write a short answer, but find it hard or in some cases impossible to write out full formulas or solutions um, digitally. Uh, what about graphs on online exams? Just any additional thoughts there? Right. If you're on Blackboard, you can write a file response question and it's there waiting for them to upload. So um, I don't know if you're proctoring or not proctoring, but you can see them if they pick up their phone, make a snap and send it to the file response. So they can attach a handwritten note. And you're right, it is difficult to type these, uh, to make graphs on, I mean, it's so difficult to type things out with all the notation. So I think writing is sometimes, or maybe for me most of the time better, just to capture it through a PDF. We use um, uh, OneDrive and we also, which works with our own UM system, but we also use Adobe Scan and it does really well to make multiple pages. They tend to want to send one page at a time. And I've gotten them where I have to keep sending them back on the practice. Like, this is not a PDF, this is a JPEG. You know, this is five separate PDFs. You didn't staple it together, so to speak, by putting it in one. It's very easy once you, you know, they're pretty savvy. Um, you know, this is a picture of your cat. This is your history homework. You know, it just keeps getting wrong, wrong, wrong until they finally get it together on the practice. And then they, they can be very good at, you know, sending their work. And what I do is I uh, bring it to Adobe, I mark it up with, a, with an online pen, and then I repost it so they can see my marking. Awesome. Um, we had one additional privacy question that came in um, regarding uh, kind of a different angle, but from technology companies and how they're protecting the student data, um, including information about IDs um, and how they might profit from student data. Have you faced that at all? Um, from your students? I haven't. Um, we generally ask for the ID, which is just our university ID. So it's not like a social security card or anything like that. It's really not necessary if you know your students because you see their face, you know what they look like, and then they move the camera down. Now, could somebody do some switch people, camera in the glasses, mission impossible thing? <laughs> yes, but that's not the majority. The majority are just trying to send it to a solver and maybe get the answers back or something like that. So we have to concentrate, I think, on the only part we can concentrate on. But as far as, yeah, having somebody now have a, a shot of somebody's passport or something, you know, maybe, maybe that could be stopped just by, if you, if you already know what you're, we have a list, we have a, pic, a full page uh, photos. So I can just look and see what they look like. They don't even really have to show an ID. And you can, in Blackboard, you can customize it to what you want them to show. Wonderful. Um, and I apologize if you shared this already, but would you share the app that you use personally for students to take pictures of their app? You mentioned, I think, a PDF generator. Is there one that you have experience with? Yeah, we use, we, well, we have Outlook as a system. And so OneDrive integrates into Outlook. They don't like that one as much, but we use it because it's already integrated. But um, Adobe Scan is very good. There are some that students thought were free, and then after 10 or so, they start charging them. So we want to make sure they're not charged for anything. So I think Adobe Scan is completely free. Um, yeah, and then they can send it to their computer and then browse my computer and attach it on. Wonderful. And then you kind of addressed using practice sessions to um, help mitigate issues with scanning and students scanning the wrong thing or it not being clear. If you do have scanned work that's un unclear when it's given for a test and maybe you're not immediately grading it, do you have a policy for how you guys are handling that when this, when what is uploaded is not what's needed? Right. And it can be sharpened on the app if they'll do it. I, in the summer, I had a student and I said, could you please just clear it up and send it again? And I had a fuzzy copy and a real copy. It was clear that they were the same thing. So I did have to ask him to clean it up and resend it, but it was the same. Wonderful. Well, it looks like we are just about out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Beverly, for and all of you for coming today. Uh, if you do have any additional questions, uh, please direct them to us at marketing at hawkslearning.com. We will also be emailing out a link today um, to view the webinar on demand. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and thank you again. Thank you.